coming up on Network Africa. Zimbabwe opposition MPs arrested after protests accused of inciting violence. Ryanair drops Afrikaans test after backlash from South Africans. And Nigeria's Ejiro Otarigo averse disaster in Delta State drives a burning tanker to save lives. We begin the program today with news from Zimbabwe, where two opposition members of parliament have been arrested following violent protests over the killing of an opposition member in Chitungwiza near the capital, Harare. Political tensions have been rising in the community after more blessing Ali's mutilated body parts were found in a well close to three weeks after she was reported missing. Job, Job Sikala and uh, Jeffrey Sitoli were arrested on allegations of uh, inciting public violence, according to their Citizens Coalition for Change party. The police have also confirmed the arrest of Mr. Sikala, accusing him of being connected to an orgy of public violence in the Yatsime area of Chitungwiza, about 30 kilometers from the capital. Chief Executive Officer of Ryanair, Michael O'Leary, says the airline has dropped a requirement for South African passengers to prove their nationalities before completing a test in Afrikaans. The low-cost carrier's controversial policy had drawn a backlash from South Africans and was criticized as a backward profiling system by the government. Afrikaans is spoken by just 12% of the population and is also often associated with apartheid and white minority rule. O'Leary described the South African government's profiling accusation as rubbish, but said the test had been dropped. A Rwandan government spokesperson, Yolande Makolo, says Rwanda is not deterred after the first flight due to take asylum seekers from the UK to the country was cancelled. Up to seven people had been expected to be removed to the East African country, but the flight was stopped after a late intervention from the European Court on Human Rights led to fresh challenges in UK courts. Makolo says that Rwanda remains fully committed to making the partnership work, adding that the current situation of people making dangerous journeys cannot continue as it's causing untold suffering to so many people. She says Rwanda stands ready to receive the migrants when they do arrive and offer them safety and opportunity in the country. Now, political affairs, Nulanda's travel to Djibouti, Mozambique and Nigeria. Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Victoria Nuland has embarked on a trip to Djibouti, Mozambique and Nigeria starting June 11, 2022 and going on to uh, the 17th in Nigeria, the undersecretary is expected to meet with government and civil society representatives to discuss issues of shared concern, including regional security, free and fair elections, and business innovation. Throughout the trip, Newland will highlight the important work the United States is doing with African and international partners to shore up global food security and health systems. Well, Ejiro Otarigo, the driver of a petrol truck that exploded in Ugeli, north local government area of Delta State in south-south Nigeria, has been receiving a lot of commendation from the Delta State government residents and other well-meaning Nigerians for his uncommon bravery, which averted a major fire disaster. Many have applauded the courage displayed by Ejiro as one that has prevented what may have been a colossal loss of lives and property worth millions of naira. Channel's television caught up with this young man who narrates what transpired on that day. A few days ago, this video went viral on social media, showing how a tanker laden with diesel caught fire at Agbaro community in Delta State. But for the uncommon bravery and heroism exhibited by the driver, identified as Ejiro Otarigo, a lot of houses and probably lives could have been lost to the inferno. Go, 
The story has it that the driver had just loaded his tanker with diesel and was driving Singh to its destination. A few minutes after leaving the loading bay, he was alerted that the tanker had caught fire. Not minding the risk to his own life, he asked the conductor to jump off the burning tanker and then drove it for about 25 minutes from a densely populated area into the Agbaru River, by which time the entire vehicle was in flames. Immediately I saw that thing, I said, okay, if I stop here, this thing will cause big problem here. You know? I just turned, I slowed down, I told my boy, you know what you do? Yeah, jump down. And then he was like, I said jump down because that my boy is new in the business. It's just about two weeks or a week plus with me. All the other boys, they have all taken their trucks, they are working on their own. So he jumped down. What was in my mind then was like, hey, you know, carry this truck, try to drive by this Agbaru River, put the river behind me here. According to eyewitnesses and other residents within the area, this act of bravery and compassion is a rarity. I think the driver is a very smart driver, an express driver, and he should be awarded for what he did because he saved a lot of lives. The, the driver has displayed gallantry. He made himself a good captain. The duty of a captain is to protect people. In order to save lives and property in Agbaro and Environ, he, he, he almost sacrificed his life. Ejiro thanks Nigerians for their prayers and support, saying he is happy that he helped to avert a disaster. Men of God has prayed for me, congregation, my community at Agbaru. Everywhere I go now, they point at me, that's the guy, that's the guy. Everything that comes from their mouth is prayer. That has given me joy, has given me happiness. The Delta State government also commends this gesture, urging other Deltans and Nigerians to emulate such compassion for others. The state government, we don't take him for granted. We have reached out to him, first to commend him. The governor directed that uh, we should also invite him to Asaba for the state to give him a letter of commendation from the office of the SSG. We have also issued a statement to let everybody know across the length and breadth of this country and indeed the entire globe that we appreciate this is act of heroism. While Ejiro Otarigo is touched by this commendation, he insists that he can sleep better knowing that his actions saved the lives of many people and properties in an incident that could have turned ugly. For the past eight months, 16 African entrepreneurs shortlisted for the 2022 Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation have undertaken intensive training and mentoring from international business leaders and experts. Earlier today, four of the finalists pitched their businesses for the chance to win £25,000 and be crowned the winner of the 2022 Africa Prize for Engineering Innovation. One of the runners-up is a Nigerian virtual borough founder of the Cribs Glow, who is working to fill in the gap in the healthcare system by creating a phototherapy crib that treats and monitors jaundiced babies. She will receive commercialization support from the Royal Academy of Engineering to accelerate her business. Well, Virtue joins us now virtually from the United Kingdom to give us more details on her journey so far. Congratulations on your journey so far, Virtue, and a warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm grateful. Right, so tell us what are your feelings right now? You're excited, I, I, I can imagine, though. I'm excited. I'm, I'm also motivated by the other participants. I don't see myself as um, top four or a finalist. I see myself as um, a winner and, and her co-winners, you know. I see this as a win for myself and every other person that, that put in for this and got to top 16. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was really tasking and I would call it amazing experience. So I'm happy and I'm so proud of how far we've come. So your pitch ended just a few hours ago and we were made to understand that you were a really strong candidate with great presentation, making it to the final four, as you just said. Did you think you would make it this far? 
Yes, I thought I would make it this far. Um, I know that the solution that we prefer in Nigeria is really a dire need. And I don't work, uh, my team, myself, um, we don't work just because we want to make money. We work with in-depth passion to save lives. And we do this with our knowledge in business development, engineering, technology, and medical sciences. So to me, I saw us going far in the competition. I was open-minded about winning because I could see the amazing ideas that other um, participants came up with. And all I wanted was for us to at least get to the top four, and we did. And I'm sure that we gave the judges a tough time in choosing the first, in choosing the only winner. If it was possible to make, um, to make all four of us winners, they would have done that. However, it is what it is. I'm excited about the opportunities that it has brought to us. I even feel, I feel lucky because um, the, the leverage and the, the opportunities media-wise that it's given to us and that it has given to us previously have been really a lot. So, I mean, I, I still see us going far even beyond this, even beyond this competition. I, I'm very hopeful. Yes, certainly working with babies and something to protect those precious ones, you know, it's something that everybody will want to buy into anyway. So, but why did you decide to create Cribber Glow? Was it based on personal experience or was it just, you know, all about the passion that you, that you just described to us right now? Yes, um, so the Creeper Glow Phototherapy Unit is an idea born out of my personal experience when my son um, was diagnosed with severe neonatal jaundice in 2015. So um, because I was a first-time mom, I didn't know much about jaundice. You only get to learn a bit of childbirth, pregnancy, you know, in your inter um, ante antenatal clinics. And that was the best I knew. I didn't know much about jaundice. It took my mother, who is a nurse, um, who came around and then saw that my son's eyes were yellow and he said we needed to go back to the hospital. So I felt that my son made it to the hospital because, not because I knew much, but because my mother knew. And, and you know, um, being faced with the challenge of unavailable phototherapy units in um, hospitals around, even when we, we found a phototherapy unit that was in use, that was available, it was not available for us. It was for, um, there, were, there were about two to three other babies on admission then. And, you know, we had to wait for longer hours. We had to go for an emergency exchange blood transfusion where we had to buy blood. And, you know, the, the whole painful process of cutting my son's navel, draining his blood and giving him new blood. It might sound normal or usual for medical practitioners, but for me, it wasn't a good experience for me and my, my family generally. And I thought my baby went through so much pain and I couldn't let that pain just pass without finding a solution for it. And I could see that the health, care, the health workers too found it challenging having to struggle with 40 phototherapy units. And even, the ones, even, when, it, even when it worked, I, um, um, I could see that even the process of the exchange blood transfusion was not an easy one. And then why not? I, I, I spoke to health professionals and spoke to mothers. I started a research. I mean, that's, that, that was the whole trigger for the whole idea. Right, I must say, what an experience you described there. And it takes me back to, you know, the World Blood Donor Day that we just celebrated and the campaign by the Lagos State government and others to get people to donate blood voluntarily. That was a precious time for you and your son to ensure that, you know, blood was available for him. I mean, yes. what could you say to that? Um... I'm, I'm only, I'm, I must say I'm grateful because at that point, the, the, doc, the doctor couldn't take my blood and they couldn't take the father's blood. And they explained mm. why they couldn't and why we had to buy, you know, blood. We also had to, I mean, I'm, I'm an educated mother and I, I could read about the risk of, you know, taking the blood. I knew that my son would most likely have malaria and they will have to treat him for malaria after a couple of days or immediately. Um, there were also other risks, risks that, you know, were quite scary to me. But 
I'm happy that it was a so that blood was a solution at that point. However, the fact that the crib uh, an innovation that like the crib glow phototherapy units that we produce is available, it reduces the need for exchange blood transfusion, you know, to a very large extent. Right, Ms. Mercer, uh, Virtue, I must thank you so much for your time today on Network Africa and good luck for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great innovation there. Well, still to come on the program. World Health Organization to rename monkeypox to avoid negative opinion of Africa. That's in a moment. Welcome back to Network Africa. The World Health Organization says it's working with experts to come up with a new name for monkeypox. It comes after more than 30 scientists wrote last week about the urgent need for a non-discriminatory and non-stigmatizing name for the virus and the disease it causes. They say continued reference to the virus as African is both inaccurate and discriminatory. About 1,600 cases of the disease have been recorded globally in recent weeks. Namibia's Environment and Tourism Ministry says it has discovered the carcasses of 11 rhinos killed by suspected poachers in a park since the beginning of the month. No arrests have been made so far as investigations continue. The ministry has urged the Namibians with any information to report it to the police or to the ministry. According to the ministry, a total of 22 rhinos have been killed by poachers since the beginning of this year alone. And Ghana's gourmet chef, Elijah Addo, is reducing food waste and feeding those in need once employed by high-end restaurants. Addo today runs West Africa's largest food bank and organizing mobile feeding campaigns has become his full-time job. He says more people are reaching out for help than ever before amid spiraling inflation. Storm clouds circled a large zinc shed outside Ghana's capital, Accra, where headquarters sat on overturned metal bowls. Disheartened by the lack of business as the encroaching rain deterred customers from the market nearby. Then gourmet chef Elijah Adu pulled up in a fully loaded food truck and started handing out plates of hot stew. Eyes widened when he said they were free and a line of brightened faces quickly threaded the area. Somewhere 2011, I came into contact with a mentally challenged man who picked leftover foods to feed his colleagues on the street. Just by his actions, one day I was quite interested in knowing why he does that. So by asking him why he does that in our local language, he told me, if he doesn't do that, who will be feeding the vulnerable? So immediately that didn't mean anything to me, but reflecting back and on my background and how being a chef, I'm able to support myself and my family, uh, made me see that instead of throwing away the leftover foods from the hotel where I worked, we could easily pack it and give it to the vulnerable. In the decades since that encounter, Ado founded West Africa's largest food bank, started a school feeding program, and organized bi-weekly food truck distributions in Accra's poorer neighborhoods. His efforts even drew Queen Elizabeth's eye, who presented him with a Young Leader Award at Buckingham Palace in 2017. As uh, West Africa's first and largest uh, food bank, we building a model that transcends beyond what we do in Ghana, but as well serves as an encouragement, serves as a platform for other uh, uh, African countries to as well learn and build the food banking model there. Ado's organization, Food for All Africa, has distributed around 3 million meals since 2015. About 40% of ingredients are unsold stock from supermarkets, wholesalers and farmers that would otherwise end up in landfills. 
Food waste reduction plays a crucial role in ADO's mission. Chefs for Change Ghana, Food for All's predecessor organization, found in 2014 that more than 35% of Ghana's food products were wasted at some point along the supply chain. While food scarcity in Ghana isn't so acute that people risk starvation, more than 28% of Ghanaians can't afford to spend more than $0.83 per day on food, according to the government data from 2016. Uh, when food goes to waste, it's not just the food you've wasted. You've wasted money, you've wasted storage spaces, you've contributed to greenhouse emission. And versus connecting this food before it going to waste to those who don't have access to food, you have created a means of nutrition, you have saved the money that would have gone wasted. As well, you've created a positive image uh, of supporting uh, your community as a business, as a corporate social responsibility. So this brings into being the importance of ensuring that instead of letting food go to waste, it can be channeled to those who don't have accessibility and affordability. And costs are climbing. Food and beverage prices were up 30.1% year on year in May, the National Statistics Service said, with overall inflation breaking an 18-year record for the second straight month. The trend worries Ado, who says more people with jobs and homes are reaching out to him for assistance than ever before. But he's also never been more sure of himself or of the role food banking can play in feeding a hungry nation. People can fall on hard times, and I can tell you the number of requests we get daily from people who, are doing, who used to do so well, they've lost their job all of a sudden, and feeding has become a challenge. So they, they want us to support them and all that. And it, it, it gives me that sense of fulfillment that what we are doing is in, indeed important. And it's part of building a stronger social system for Ghana. In the meantime, the World Food Programme says that uh, food assistance to 1.7 million people in South Sudan has been suspended, citing a funding crunch and rising needs. The latest integrated food security phase classification uh, shows that it's the last thing South Sudan needs. A WFP official explained that more than two in three people are experiencing a severe humanitarian and protection crisis and need help to survive. The development comes as communities prepare for a fourth consecutive year of flash flooding, which has left vast stretches of ground sodden and fields unusable, particularly in Jongli, Upper Nile and Unity States. WFP, we had planned to provide food assistance to 6.2 million people this year, but faced with increasing humanitarian needs and insufficient funding, we have taken the painful step to suspend food assistance to 1.7 million people. And these are people that are experiencing emergency and crisis levels of food insecurity, what we call IPC4 and IPC3. We are particularly concerned with these cuts, especially because these cuts are happening at the start of the lean season, when families have completely exhausted any food reserves and are likely to continue to suffer acute levels of hunger as the lean season deepens. Essentially, WFP in South Sudan, we are in farming prevention mode. That's Network Africa today. Thank you for watching. I'm Joka Rogers.